You know when you watch a boxing match in between rounds, you always see this ugly fellow with hair as white as all of Antarctica. A complexion similar to bowl of porridge and a gut so huge you'll need professional mountain climbers to reach the top just so they can remind the dude what his toes look like. And he looms over these muscle-bound specimens, guys who look like Atlas with punching gloves, berating and slapping them about as if they were children who just spilled milk on the floor. That's me. Although I can see my toes just fine. Francis Achiai is the name, although you can call me Franco. You're probably wondering why some old fossil is writing on the internet where they tell spooky stories, right? Well, because I got something spooky to tell. I ain't much of a writer and I don't care for it, rather live my own life than some other in a book, you know? But something happened to me, it was like a dog's age away from now that I never told anyone. So I heard from a young boxing friend whose eyes are glued to his phone rather than his sandbag that there are stories people put on the internet about frightening experiences they had to let the world know about. What I got to tell is a boxing story. When you think about boxing, there's only so many ways you can tell it and the Rocky films cover all the bases. But this story isn't about a champion falling from their insurmountable plateau or an underdog cliché. This is a real story I saw with my eyes and felt with my body. And I tell you, this no sleep story will make sure you never wink for as long as you draw breath. You should be thanking me I'm writing this at all. My hands have arthritis and I'm sick of these red and green lines telling me I'm wrong. I know how to spell my surname, asshole. So, let's take it from the top. Before I was a coach, I was that Atlas with 12 ounce gloves. Because of my surname, people called me the Axe Man. I know some of you are looking my name up now on BoxRec or something and trying to find me, but don't bother. The people that called me that was either friends on the street or thugs who knew me too well. My name was never announced in the ring. The day before my professional debut, I got into a bare-knuckle fight I didn't want to get into at a pub in London, ended up with a retinal detachment or whatever excuses the doctors gave me. This was on the night of June 1982, and I was only 22 years old. I was supposed to fight Frank Bruno, who instead fought Tony Moore and won. I could have been that loser. All those years of dreaming and training my body was wasted in 20 seconds just because I spilled some beer on someone. I kept having this dream ever since, where I'm in my boxing gear, the trunks for my professional debut. Standing in front of me is Frank Bruno, and I'm within reach of him, but my jabs don't hit him. It was as if he moved an inch away, and no matter what I could do to get him, I can never reach him. My 20s that I wanted to spend as a boxer ended up being spent in whatever crappy, tedious jobs you could dream of. The closest I ever got to boxing was watching it on a box, and couldn't even afford a ticket from time to time. In 1989, my father who I was looking after passed away. He lived his life the way he wanted to, taking so many gambles knowing he could either win or lose it all. I spent my prime getting pissy about what happened to me that night, thinking it was a door of opportunity forever closed. But I had an idea, a gamble. So I took it. I sold my house, all my possessions, and my car, hell, I even sold all my clothes. The only thing I couldn't sell was my pet parrot, Eubank. This was before Chris Eubank was big, but because I know you'll all ask, yeah, later on I did give my little parrot a monocle. So with nothing but my parrot, the money I made and the clothes on my back, I opened a gym. Franco's Gym. I don't use much of the creative side of my brain, but it sounded friendly, like a hangout for aspiring boxers. I had some good fighters here and there during the early 90s, all different divisions, but none of them ever made it to a world title. Hell, I couldn't even make it to the top rankings. It kept me afloat for a few years, but I knew if I didn't find something soon, I'd be drowned in debt. Then the day came. July 5th, 1995, my 35th birthday. The best present I could ever receive walked into my gym. Six feet nine, muscles like iron covered in skin, legs so long I counted two steps from the entrance to the front desk. He asked me if he could pay for just a day's membership and I said sure. Saw him to the bag, and despite the sloppy stance that boy could punch. One lazy jab and I thought the bag would explode. Everyone else in the gym stood still and watched him work in awe of his raw power. 
I walked over to him when he was taking a break and started chewing the fat. He never really had interest in boxing, just had a lot of frustration and didn't want to take any of it out on another person. I asked him if he had any goals, he said no. I told him next, what if your goal would be the heavyweight champion of the world? He laughed and said the chance of that happening would be one in a million. I told him he was one in a million, fists the size of sledgehammers but faster than a shooting bullet. I said you're sloppy but I got the knowledge to match your power and together, we have a combination to throw the world off its axis. He stared at me for a long time. Eventually though he smiled, said yeah sure, why not? And at that moment, I felt like the 22 year old me, who was excited to take the first step to becoming champion. Now I had a second chance through this young man, capable of standing up to or even surpassing the likes of Tyson or Lewis. I asked him what his name was. He said Braddock Manson. I told him in a few years time Braddock Manson will be announced the new king of boxing. Braddock smiled and stuck out his hand. It's a deal. I remember the trembling feeling that a young man's grip, knowing the power in those muscles could knock out anything or anyone in their path. I sort of felt this immense tension in my body, you know? I was afraid of what could happen to his opponents, weeks in hospital, retiring early, or even death. Then damn Eubank yelled something that broke the tension and made us both laugh until we pulled every muscle. Wanna know what he said? He said, champ. Champ. God damn it. I had to take a break from writing. I feel like an eagle using its talons to try and write. So anyway, Braddock and I didn't just stand around talking about how great he's gonna be. I got him training right off the bat and not a second was wasted. Road work, shadow boxing, weight training, skipping rope, footwork in sand, any possible form of training any boxer had ever done, we did it. I even got him to chase the chicken around every now and then. It's been helpful for a lot of old school heirs, but it's so damn funny to watch. September comes around and Braddock's body is already showing improvements, muscles showing up where they weren't before. But he looked exhausted, both body and mind. He keeps asking me when we're gonna stop running and start fighting. I told him if you want a well done steak, you gotta give it time to cook. Clever as he is, he didn't want a steak. He wanted someone's blood on his boxing gloves. I remember thinking that if his jab is as sharp as his tongue, he won't need many matches to reach the top. I didn't really have a business plan other than training. I never was a promoter. But one thing I know about business is that you get opportunities, whether you get them yourself or they land right in your lap. Our opportunity came walking through the door, punching the same bag. Right, so let me tell you about this guy a little bit. Sometime after I started the gym, this guy who looks like a bank accountant comes walking in and asks if he could buy the yearly membership. I said sure, he pays me in cash and then takes off his blazer. Doesn't change into gym wear, doesn't even take off his tie. He punches the bag a few times. Then he leaves. He's been doing this ever since. Same suit, same bag and same amount of punches. He'd do this once every five or six months and stay for a total of five minutes every time. But he'd always pay yearly and I didn't want to ask questions, he was keeping the gym afloat. So I'm in the gym with Braddock, working the mitts and breaking the arthritis in my hands. Mr. Suit and Tai comes in, takes off the blazer and does the same one too, doesn't beat on the bag. Then he does something he's never done before. He turns around and watches us. He comes over to the ring and we stop and look at him. You never told me you was a coach, he said, acting like we've been a band of brothers this whole time. He asked if we had any matches coming up. I said we've just met and started training, haven't thought that far. He told me he's a host at an underground boxing club, kind of a rinky-dink setup, but good for amateurs looking for a fight. He had a match coming up tonight, but someone bailed at the last minute and wondered if Braddock felt ready, if he would like the chance. We looked at each other. Then we looked at him. Freak it, we must have both thought because next thing you know we nodded at the same time. He said wonderful, gave us the time and the place and walked away. Didn't even pick up his blazer on his way out. 
A few seconds pass, we finally look at each other and start cheering, hollering, destroying sound barriers all over. We were cheering as if we had already won the fight. The remainder of the day was spent having a rest, going over a rough strategy, never mind that we had the faintest idea who the opponent was, could have been Popeye for all we knew, and laughing about Mr. Suit and Tie. Not that it matters to you, but man, I only ever heard him once and hearing him again, you know when you dial a number on your phone and you get that machine voice? What do they call it, automated? He sounded like that, but with an accent. And the way he walks. I didn't notice until now, but he marches instead of walking casually. What a character. How little we knew back then. Tonight's the night. That Neil Young song kept playing over in my head as we walked to the venue. It was as cold as any London night could be, but the buzz kept me warm enough. I'm not going to tell you what the place is called or where to find it in case some nut thinks it's funny to go there. But it looked stripped down, barren, as if it's been closed for decades. We were getting worried we came to the wrong place, though maybe it was a setup. Then the front door opened and out came a behemoth of a man. Have you ever watched that show, Dog the Bounty Hunter? He was like that, but with more hair. Like a lion wearing all black and fitted with a Bluetooth earpiece. We walked to him, asked if this was the boxing venue. He didn't say a word, just let us right in. You couldn't tell from the outside, but the place was full of life. We walked down the steps to the sound of music, crowds. It wasn't until the last step that we saw the sea of people swaying their bodies to the music as if possessed. We saw flesh clinging onto flesh, hands exploring where they're usually forbidden. Braddock asked me if we walked into a match or an orgy. I couldn't answer that one. Mr. Suit and Ty came to greet us, walked us into his office away from the ravenous crowd. I noticed that he had a slab of beef covered in wrapping. Saw it before he managed to stash it in his drawer. It looked like he'd got it from the butchers just a few minutes ago, which was kind of funny. After all, how many butchers do you know that open past 5 p.m.? He explained that the match was like any other. You have a set number of rounds and you win either by knockout or by the judges, one of those being himself. He asked the U.S. how many rounds we want to go. For being the minimum and 12 usually the maximum, but it could go longer if everyone involved was willing. I knew that Braddock felt like he could go 12 rounds, but every cocky fighter feels that way until they get hit for the first time. I said four because the opponent could tire him out in the later rounds, when muscles like Braddock's could turn into weights pulling him down. He asked if we were sure because longer rounds meant more of a payday. I was wary. He sounded like a cat trying to convince a mouse to be willingly eaten alive. I said four rounds, final. It was then I noticed his intense glare, the only time I ever saw something human in his face. With that sorted, we signed the contract for the fight so we could be entitled to the money. And with our signatures on the paper, there was no backing out now. He shook both our hands and wished us good luck, prayed that we didn't leave it to the judges. After being shown directions to the dressing room, we got set up. Braddock got in his gear and started shadow boxing. He was really pumping himself up. We didn't have time to get trunks made, so I lent him the trunks I was supposed to wear for the Frank Bruno fight. They fit like they were made for him. Not a surprise, I guess. His physique was similar to mine. I like to think that if it weren't for the color of our skin, people would have mistaken us for twins. While he was preparing, I got sunk into deep thoughts about that night, wondering why I was thrown off my path in life before I could even take my first step. I began to think it was because that path wasn't for me. I had to wait until Braddock came along to walk that path and I would guide him through. Boxing can be like walking through a dark forest, never knowing what lurks and waits for you. I was the axe man that cut down the lurkers for him. I get his gloves on and suddenly he starts getting the shakes real bad. What if I lose, he asks, and I notice he's starting to cry. I tell him to look in the mirror. He does. Look at the man staring back at you, crying and shaking with fear. Look at him for a long time, I said. When you look away, that babbling fool will not be there anymore. When you win the fight, look in the mirror and you'll find a man on the other side that knows what it takes to win. Every victory you get, 
that man will be with you. Every step you take, you're getting closer to him, the man you want to be. Leave this sorry sight behind right now and start heading towards the man you were meant to be. He looks away from the mirror, the sorry sight of a man disappearing with him. He heads through the corridor and into the light. I smile because he has already done more than I was ever able to do. He took the first step to becoming a champion of the ages. Braddock was the first to walk through the crowd as the announcer introduced the new challenger to them. They booed before the announcer could say a word. They must do this to all the young bloods that come in, but in the ring it's all the more better when the challenger knocks the other guy out. It's how he gained his first fans. Now, when this other guy comes through the crowd, they praise him like the queen strolling through the street in a carriage. I couldn't quite get a glimpse of the guy as the crowd was swallowing him up when he got on that stage. My God. I can't think of any word other than flabbergasted. I'm gonna tell you now, there was plenty wrong with this man. Here's the first two things I noticed. He was twice as small as Braddock and twice as pudgy. Even with that extra baggage on his gut, there's no way he could have been heavyweight. Maybe middleweight, super middleweight at best. I start to notice more details. It was as if the match was fast forwarded for him already. He was sweaty, out of breath, looked sick and ready to fall onto the floor before the first gong rings. His hair was black on the sides, but white from the top. The streak went all the way to the back of his head. The announcer said he was from South Africa and had 150 amateur fights, all by decisions. How could all those fights be decisions? In what world does anyone have that kind of record? Braddock whispered in my ear that he wouldn't let this one go to the judges. I smiled. Oh, and another thing, the announcer called this guy some name I couldn't pronounce, but said his nickname was Honey. What kind of nickname is that? I remember wondering if this was a novelty match we stumbled into. We go into our corners. I'm telling Braddock that this guy looks out of breath, but it might be a tactic. Just take your time and play around with some combinations. I wasn't much for imagination, so I stole from the best. We use the number system Demato taught to Tyson because it's easy to remember and easy to make good combinations. Gong rings, first round starts. Braddock took it slow, getting into rhythm, taking a few jabs from Honey, learning his style, his timing. Most of the fight he just clinched, trying to waste seconds worth of points. Guess that's why they call him Honey. That crowd was the most ferocious I've ever seen. It looked like any second they would break into the ring and rip those boxers to shreds. There was more rage outside the ring than in it. Bell rings. Braddock comes back, hardly breaking a sweat. He's got his rhythm down and his timing down. I told him don't go for the two-to-one combination yet. It's just an amateur fight. Get as much as you can out of these rounds, then knock him out on the fourth. He nods, gets the mouth guard back in, and goes on the sound of the second bell. This round is no different. Braddock testing things we were working on back in the gym. Braddock sways from a right hook and uppercuts Honey's chin, almost lifting this guy's feet off the floor. It sends him staggering back, and it's a good sign. Shows he's got a glass jaw, which we'll work on in the last round. Things went according to plan, but in the last 10 seconds, Honey throws one hell of a jab in Braddock's face, making a small cut on his cheek. Bell rings, the crowd goes crazy. I used the inswell on his face and tried to stitch his cut. We were lucky it wasn't too deep. He asked me if I noticed the glass jaw. I said I did brains as well as brawn, this Braddock. He started breathing heavily, and before the bell rang, he told me that punch was the hardest thing he ever felt in his life. Before I had the chance to think about that, the third bell rang. Right out the gate, Honey sent another punch, staggering Braddock. No more time to play around, I guess. He gets serious, starts throwing punches anywhere where he can hit. Braddock tries the uppercut, but Honey isn't stupid. He knows to avoid getting hit on his weak spot again. It's so astounding. This man looked like he needed to go to the hospital, and now he's putting up a fight. He's still panting and sweating all the fluids out of his body, but if that's how he fights in this condition, I can't imagine what he'd be like in top condition. Every second, I felt like it could have been anyone's win, the game changing so suddenly. Bell rings, and Braddock comes back 
breathing hard and sweating buckets. I'm trying to tell him to take some shots and wait for the opening so he can do the two to one. I couldn't quite hear him over the crowd, but he said that Honey started hissing at him. He'd never heard anything like that from a human. Last bell rings. Now every second a punch was thrown. I really thought that one of the two fighters were going to go down at any moment. Braddock was getting blitzed, Honey's arms like machine guns all of a sudden. Braddock was taking the hits well. His legs were shaking like an earthquake, but he stood tall. Then bam. The two to one shines through. Two hits on the jaw and Honey went down. The crowd went berserk. You know when something is so loud that everything else seems quiet? The ref starts counting, a little too slow if you ask me, but he might as well have been counting to a million because Honey was out cold. Braddock walked to me, winked and smiled. He knew he'd bagged his first victory. All of a sudden, the crowd started cheering and we both knew it wasn't for us. Braddock turned around and Honey was up on his feet, still breathing heavily and looking sick but not beat up. Not even a little punch weary. The way he glared at Braddock still gives me chills, silent amongst the screaming people circling them like a school of piranhas. The ref talks to the judges. Words were exchanged. I already knew what was going on. Honey gets unanimous decision number 51. Then the ref comes back and shouts one more round decides all. Mr. Suit and Ty didn't mention this. The crowd was so loud that I couldn't hear anything. Everything happened in slow motion, both fighters walking to the middle of the ring. Braddock looked determined, ready to become the next Ollie, the next Tyson. Honey stopped breathing, still as a statue. The only thing I hear is the ref saying to touch gloves. Braddock touches Honey's first. I remember looking at Honey's gloves, which were yellow and black, something I'd never really seen before. Then I saw them explode. Braddock went from hungry champion to babbling fool all in one moment, looking at his gloves and the blood soaking into them, oozing out of the holes Honey made. He falls to the floor and starts slithering backwards away from Honey. The only way I can describe what happened next is that he changed. Honey's gloves were now completely shredded by what had burst out of them, sharpened bone, I guess. I remember thinking of that horror movie where those kids get killed in their dreams. He was a hairless guy when he entered the ring, but now he was covered in thick black hair. In places I didn't even know people could have hair, I'd watched it grow out of his skin. God, I even saw his eyes change color, like the pupil had grown to make the whole eye black. I watched as he walked towards the retreating Braddock, his legs shrinking and loosening from his boots. Braddock tried to escape, but the crowd held him in place. I watched as Honey's newly emerged claw started slashing into Braddock's muscle. Muscle he spent a long time trying to gain, a physique that would have shocked the heavyweight, was now being sliced and clawed into like a knife against warm butter. It wasn't until I saw his bowels fall out that I processed what was happening. I yelled his name, tried to get into the ring, but the crowd pulled me back. Hands grabbed me, a thousand faces ready to rip into me like they were with poor Braddock. I had only one choice. During the night I was supposed to fight Bruno, I didn't tell the whole story. The reason I got into the fight was because I drew a gun on someone. I always kept that gun despite what it caused. Still do. The night of the Braddock fight, it paid off. I shot my way through the crowd, the pillars of legs stopping me any chance they got. Miraculously, I made it to the entrance. I looked back. I wish I hadn't. In the ring there were many of them. Some still looked human but others, not so much. I could see Honey, see his dark fur with a white streak on his back. I thought for a long time about what he reminded me of. With one bullet left, I shot the bouncer in the face before he had any inkling to what was going on downstairs. I ran to my car. I drove as if all of hell was chasing after me. As I was driving down the motorway, something popped into my head. Honey Badger. That's what he looked like. I know you'll think it's stupid, I sure do. But a Honey Badger killed Braddock. I will never, ever forget that I laughed to myself that night as I drove through the abyss, where creatures unknown were laughing back at me. That's the story.
this must have happened, what, 20 years ago? Since then, I closed the gym, got as far away from London as possible and spent years going back to those jobs I dreaded most, keeping to myself. The first few years were hard, when I wasn't working my ass off I'd come to my caravan and get drunk off my ass. Drown the bad thoughts out of my head, sweat them through my skin the next morning. I was close to shooting myself with the gun that saved my life. It did it again when it jammed on me. I must have made myself believe that it was a dream and it never happened because after that, I was fine. I stopped drinking, worked really hard and even found work at a gym overseas in sunny California. I'd always wanted to go and was hoping to go overseas when I was a boxer. As you know that didn't bode well with my creator, but all the money I slaved to earn got me a small little house in Anaheim. I started working for a small-time gym. The simplistic life has always suited me in the end. So maybe there's a question you've been asking yourself right now. I bet I can guess it to A.T. If I've been keeping it secret for so long, why suddenly tell the story now? Even admitting to killing? Well, let me tell you about another boxer. His name's Jackie Malfurs. Heard of him? If not, he was an upcoming heavyweight champion ready to fight in Vegas to claim the world title. I knew the kid, even came down with his coach to talk to the other aspiring boxers. During his latest fight, he was not the person I met at the gym. He froze, didn't fight at all then suddenly started lashing out, causing a major uproar and even losing his license to box ever again. I wondered what happened to him so I personally rang his coach up. The coach was baffled. He'd never told anyone but Jackie was talking about this mole thing and it was really freaking his coach out. If what happened to me was a dream, was Jackie dreaming something almost the same? I wish that was the case, but I doubt that. Ladies and gentlemen, you may not believe my story and I don't care, but heed my warning nonetheless, there are creatures among us, dwelling in our skin and blending into our lives. It could be the paper boy you see every morning. It could be your next door neighbor who always asks to borrow your lawn mower. It could be some lady broadcasting the weather. It could be anyone. If you believe me, don't do what I did. Don't spend most of your years away from people. Just be cautious, grow eyes on the back of your head and examine those close to you. They might have lived on this earth longer than us. They could be larger in numbers than us, but their cracks are starting to show and they're getting bigger by the day. Their cover will be shattered and exposed to the world. And when that happens, the darkness will cloud us and we won't know who our friends or enemies are. Just them lurking in the obsidian. Smiling. I'm pretty sure I saw a ghost. Just for a little bit of context, I live and was born in England, but am Italian. My family owns property in Italy. We used to drive over from England to Italy for the summer school holidays. One year we went to Emilia Romagna, which is where my granddad's village is situated. Whilst driving, we decided to visit the local castle. The Castle of Barty. I must have been anything from around six or seven years old. The castle, from what I remember, has staff and is more of a museum. I'm not going to go in and out of the details, I'm just going to keep it really brief. Whilst in the castle, we walked around all the halls. We saw all the normal castle stuff like torture equipment, old paintings, and museum curiosities from the era. My mom read the little information boards to me about the castle, which I didn't really listen to. As a kid, I only wanted to see knight's armor and weapons. I wandered off a little bit from my mom, but no more than round the corner of one of the corridors. From what I remember, the corridor was bright and well lit. It was just in a normal corridor, nothing special. Not like a bedroom or creepy cellar. Just a long, fancy corridor. This is when I saw a woman walking towards me. She wasn't directly heading towards me. She was just walking down the corridor towards where I just came. She was walking at some pace as if she was late to something. For a split second, I saw nothing wrong with this until I really looked at her. She wasn't see-through or smoky or anything like that. If that would have been the case, I would have definitely run off screaming. Her skin was super white with a yellow tinge and big dark purple bags under her eyes. 
Her eye bags looked more like bruises, purple and black in color. She looked really sick. She looked like an old horror movie's depiction of a person rising from the dead. She was wearing really strange attire. She was dressed in a medieval-style purple dress with a high collar. There was nothing modern about the dress. Her clothes weren't like goth clothes or some eccentric style. She was definitely in period clothes. As she went to almost pass me, she stared directly at me. She looked annoyed, but not at me. Just like she was pissed off and happened to see me. She held her gaze for longer than you would look at a stranger as if she was shocked that I could see her or was gobsmacked by how rude I was being. Of course, I don't know why she looked at me like that, but she was not happy. She then walked off down the corridor and out of sight. I then went to find my mom and told her about the whole situation. She just said it must have been an actor. She then just carried on walking. The woman in the purple dress must have had to pass her. The fact that she didn't seem spooked at all made me just forget about it. I didn't think anything of this situation for years. It was about five years ago I was talking about what happened. I wasn't necessarily saying I saw a ghost just retelling what I saw. My mom just stopped and looked really uncomfortable. I said what? She went on to explain what she remembered from that day. She said I came to her really upset and scared of a lady in a purple dress that I saw. She then relays the story just as I remembered. She believed there must have been actors. My mom then went on to explain as we were leaving she spoke to the reception staff. She asked if there was any actors or some kind of show on. The staff said no. She then mentioned what I had just seen to the staff. The staff member then replied with something like, yeah, people see stuff here in a really casual manner. This obviously freaked my mom out. She never mentioned this to me as she knew it would freak me out. She didn't bother mentioning it to my dad as he is super cynical. She also didn't tell any of my siblings as she didn't want to upset them. Years later, I'm thinking about it now. I keep listening to supernatural and paranormal audiobooks. I still don't know what I saw. I never had that type of imagination as a kid. I never had imaginary friends or suffered a hallucination. I have a good imagination, but never anything like this. Looking into the castle's history, there have been ghost sightings there before, but who knows? The most seen ghost that wanders the castle is apparently a male in armor. There is a story about his partner killing herself after she was wrongly informed he had died at sea. Apparently, he then returned to hear of her dimes and also killed himself. I don't really believe in ghosts or spirits, but what I saw was real. There was no trick of the light, drugs, mental health, sleep deprivation, or any other logical reason for it. Unless all the staff were in on some kind of prank, which is highly unlikely. It also does not explain how my mom didn't see the lady. All of this has made me a believer in the paranormal, however I still won't say it out loud in fear of attracting something's attention. I was listening to one of your narrations about creepy work stories, and I have had my fair share of creepy work encounters, but this one takes the cake. I've never written it down before, nor have I ever posted anything like this, so please forgive me for any mistakes I may make. Now, time for the store. As I said, this story is about a creepy work encounter that happened when I was working late one night. Now, for some context, I am a 20-year-old female, but this story takes place two years ago when I was 18. At the time, I was working your typical fast food job at a local sub shop. I live in America as well. I had worked there for a little over a year at that point and had been promoted to an assistant manager. My particular position meant a lot of evening shifts as the store closed at 9 p.m. every day. We specialized in fast deliveries and we were short-staffed at the time, so this meant I was working mostly alone with one delivery driver. The job was pretty relaxed, all things considered. I was never really too concerned about working alone as I was familiar with this part of town and would often walk to work, though my parents would give me a ride home at night. I was only ever really scared after 9 p.m. because that's when all of my co-workers would go home and I'd stay to complete all of my management and paperwork. The place was really creepy in the dark, 
The building was located in a small strip mall of sorts, the only other stores there were a local taco place and then a dollar store. I'd often finish all my tasks around 10 to 10.30 p.m., and all the adjacent stores closed at 9 p.m. as well. That just meant that by the end of my shift, the parking lot would be empty, apart from maybe a stray car passing through. Now, to better illustrate this story for you, the parking lot was a wide one. The strip mall had an L shape to it, my store being near the corner of the L. At the corner, there was an exit to an adjacent street and a small bar there. At the other end of the parking lot was an abandoned supermarket, so not much street traffic would happen in this particular parking lot. Outside of the shops was a little sidewalk that stretched in front of every shop door, and there were little pillars that went to the ceiling, so it was semi-enclosed. Think of your typical strip mall walkway. So, at any rate, I had developed a routine for my closing duties as a manager. After I'd finish all my tasks and do a basic run-through of the store making sure everything was off and cleaned, all the doors shut and locked, and the lights off, i text my mom to let her know I was ready for her to pick me up. Then, usually, I'd wait by the door inside the building and just watch the parking lot while I waited. I never waited outside, typically as I watched slash listened to a lot of horror stories, and I don't want to say I'm a paranoid person, but I am cautious. So it was a habit of mine to always wait inside the building until my mother pulled up and she could watch me lock the door. Now, this story takes place in late October. It had been a quiet night, and the fall leaves had come and gone. This night was a little bit different than my typical shifts as I actually happened to be training someone to be a manager. It went well, but after I had finished showing them my nightly walkthrough of all the things to check and keep in mind. I had texted my mom just as we were getting ready to leave as I had wrapped up her training and was completing it. This led to a bit of an awkward moment as I wasn't going to just say, now we lock the door and leave, and then just usher her out and lock the door and stay. Just due to the awkwardness of it all, I happened to walk out with her so we could leave together, and she watched me lock the door before she hopped into her own car. This was my first mistake, as my mother hadn't actually arrived, and I knew she wouldn't be there for at least another five minutes. I had just opted to wait outside, something I never usually did. The air was nice and cool, not in a chilly way, but in a refreshing way. The night was still young as it had been around 10.15 at this point, not too late, but it was definitely dark. The girl I was training had offered me a ride home, but I declined as my mom had been on my way. She asked me if I wanted her to stay, just in case, until my mom got there, but I declined that as well. That was definitely my second mistake, upon reflection. I just didn't want to spend any more time with this woman than I had to, as her and I didn't necessarily get along. So, she got into her car and pulled away. This left me alone in the parking lot, and I had decided to wait and lean against the pillar just outside the sub shop's door as I waited for my mom. She had sent me a text at that point that she was getting ready to leave, and we only left about five or so minutes away. I popped one earbud in and began to listen to music, mostly to calm my nerves. As I said, waiting outside was out of the norm for me, and I wasn't exactly a fan of the dark. I left one out, though, so I could be aware of my surroundings. That's when I noticed him, or rather, he noticed me. As I was leaning against the pillar, I saw a car had entered from the far side of the parking lot and was driving past me towards the corner of the setup where the exit was, which in itself was pretty normal. What caught my attention, though, was when he passed me, he had slowed a little bit, and he looked at me. Now, when I said look at me, I meant he looked at me. I remember it sending a chill down my spine as my gut immediately told me something was off. It wasn't a quick glance or even just a quick turn of the head. He had jerked his body and turned his head back to look behind the passenger seat through the back window, body pivoting unnaturally in the car to really look at me. The kind of gesture you do when someone says, look, frantically in a car, and you have to turn your whole body to look in that direction before you miss it. At this point, I was more annoyed at the fact that this dude looked at me. I didn't get a good glance at him, but from what I could tell, he was probably mid-60s, balding, and definitely giving off creepy old guy vibes. I got hit on a lot at work by older men, so I was just over it. 
Though, as annoyed as I was, him looking at me didn't really set my alarm bells ringing, so I pulled out my phone to browse some more music while I was waiting. I had just about written it off when I noticed some headlights coming from the direction he had just went, which is the same way my mother would enter the parking lot, so I pulled out my earbud and began to shove my phone into my pocket when I looked up. That's when it became very apparent to me that that was not my mom, but the same guy who just did a whole head turn to look at me. The bastard had done a loop around the corner after looking at me and had come back. Now, this set my alarm bells ringing, and I remember grabbing my pepper spray and losing the trigger of it. I watched as he pulled up in front of the Dollar General, facing me directly, and parked. It was hard to tell, as I couldn't really see into his car from this distance, but I could feel him staring at me. I remember just staring back, and I remember walking a bit further away to the other pillar, using it to block his view of me. I knew my mother would be there any moment, so I wasn't really scared, but more creeped out. At this point, it was just him and me in this parking lot. I remember watching his headlights flick off as he just appeared to be waiting. I remember thinking about all those horror stories you hear and remembering tips I had heard of about similar situations. So, while I waited for my mom, I peeked my head out from the pillar and stared into his car. I wanted him to know I knew he was there, and I remember holding up my pepper spray, which was attached to one of those self-defense keychains, and shaking it at him. I wanted to show him I was armed and aware of his presence. After a very tense minute or so of him staring at me and waiting, my mother finally pulled into the parking lot. She drove past him and had actually looped past him to do a little U-turn to exit the parking lot. When I got into the car with her, we both started talking at once. She had said something along the lines of, did you see the creepy old guy staring at you? And me explaining everything that happened. She was also a fellow watcher of true crime and all those horror stories, so she was just as wary as I was. We agreed that it was just creepy, and the fact that she had noticed him made me feel a little less paranoid and validated in my wariness. We just decided to keep him on our radar, and we went to pull out of the parking lot. Just as we did so, we saw his headlights flick on. We both immediately noticed this, and she turned off onto the road. At this point, we just started driving towards my house. The thing is, the street we pulled onto was a long back road of sorts that connected two main roads. It had neighborhoods on either side with multi-hole entrances into my neighborhood near the end of the road. We saw him pull onto the road, but a bit away behind us. At this point, we are both utterly creeper out, but it could still be a coincidence that he had just happened to be going the same way as us. But, my mother and I were both the cautious kind, so we decided to pass our normal entrance into the neighborhood. If you go past the street leading into our neighborhood, there is a small intersection, and if you went right, it would lead you into a roundabout, which also led to the police station. Our neighborhood was one of those giant suburbs, and we knew there was another entrance by the police station, so we decided to take that entrance. On the off chance he was following us. I remember everything just feeling so surreal as I watched the car behind us him in the passenger seat mirror. I remember eerily as I watched his headlights speed up to catch up to us, and I remember my stomach dropping as his right turn signal flicked on, indicating he was going the same way as us. My mother made the right turn, and as we started to approach the roundabout, she told me to call my dad. We went through the roundabout, and the police station was on our right. He had followed us the whole way there, which had been seven minutes at this point. We pulled into the police station parking lot, and this idiot actually followed us in. Though it wasn't totally obvious, it was the police station parking lot as the courthouse and library all shared the same lot. I remember my mother parking in front of the voice station, though closer to the back. I watched as the man had pulled in front of the courthouse. I was on the phone with my dad who at this point was already on the way with his gun. The creepy man had just sat in the car, staring. Now, I know what you're probably wondering, which is why I didn't go into the police station with my mom immediately. The thing is, my mother had a suspended license, as she was an alcoholic and had a DUI. She only ever drove to pick me up after work since my dad always worked early in the morning. 
So, she was technically illegally driving, and I didn't have a license, so we waited for my dad to get there before going in. The bastard sat in front of the courthouse for five minutes before rapidly pulling out of the parking lot. I believe he finally noticed where we were. I mean, how stupid do you have to be to follow someone into the police station? I always wondered if he was on something due to this. When my dad did arrive, he went into the police station with me to report the incident. I'm pretty sure nothing ever happened with that, as it's not a crime to stalk a teenager by trying to follow them home. At this point, I was pretty shaken up as nothing like this had ever happened to me before. Like, he actively tried to follow me home. There was no mistaking it. The route we took was unconventional, and he had to intentionally follow us to end up there. It makes me wonder, what if we had pulled into my neighborhood? What were his intentions? Would he have followed me home, and if he did, what was his plan? It was clearly nothing good, that much I know. I did end up quitting this job about a week later for somewhat unrelated reasons. My boss kept insisting I work alone at night after knowing everything that happened. I remember a white van circling the building once at 10.30 p.m. the day I quit, which was creepy enough but easy to write off. So, I got away safe in the end. I just hope this story can remind everyone to always be wary of your surroundings. It's better to be safe than sorry, so even if you're not sure that stranger is actually staring at your or might have bad intentions, always play it safe. I'm glad to this day that my mother had also noticed him and listened to me. Who knows what could have happened had she just blew it off. Stay safe, y'all. Ever since I was young, I've wanted to travel. I always had these dramatized ideas of what big cities were going to be like, thank you Hollywood. But seeing and experiencing the reality has left me wary and somewhat traumatized. So, I grew up in small towns in the Midwest, and during COVID I joined an online group to make friends with similar interests. Two of these friends happened to live around Chicago, so naturally I wanted to go and visit the big city and hang out with my new friends. I'd never encourage meeting with people you met online, but I'd been video chatting and hanging out virtually with these girls for over a year before I planned the trip. I even brought my best friend who at six feet was an intimidating presence until you got to know that he was an actual teddy bear underneath the scary scowl. We'll refer to him as Brad and my friends as Steph and Jesse. To give you more context that will be important to this story later, I and my two online friends are petite pretty women ranging from age 19 to 23 at the time of this story, with me being the oldest. Since this trip was my idea, I handled everything from the itineraries, budgets, and hotel accommodations. I found this really cute and affordable motel in downtown Chicago where Brad could park his car at night because he had driven to Chicago from a few states over. Everything was amazing that first day. Despite the Chicago heat being on steroids and the traffic terrifyingly congested, we got to explore downtown Chicago in all its glory. There were only a few instances where some people we encountered caused us to give a wide berth, and Brad was always right there following behind us like a stoic bodyguard. It was on the second and third day when my rose-tinted glasses were truly ripped from my eyes. That second night we had stayed up late watching YouTube videos of our favorite band, so by the time we went to bed it was already dark out. And with our motel being in downtown, we could clearly hear the nightlife going full tilt outside our window. Sometime after 2 a.m., I was woken up by the screeching of car tires and the very recognizable sounds of gunshots. Brad was in the bed next to me while Steph and Jesse were still sleeping in the other bed. Brad got up and very carefully pulled back the blinds, but whatever had happened was further down the street. He and I just looked at each other and decided not to wake up the other girls, though I can't say I got much sleep the rest of that night. And in the morning Brad showed me the news report that detailed the drive-by shooting that had occurred at a bar a few blocks down. The next day was our last day in Chicago and I had planned for all of us to spend a good portion of it in Chinatown. My friends, who again were from the area of Chicago, warned us that we had to be careful on the trains and streets south of the main tourist avenues. I had already become acquainted with the sketchiness of Chicago train stations, but I didn't take their words as seriously as I should have. We spent hours in Chinatown. 
visiting every shop in the outdoor strip mall and spending way too much money at the K-pop store. I was absolutely enamored with everything, having never gotten to buy certain stuff before due to my town being at least a fraction as big as Chicago is. So, by the time we got back on the train I was excitedly talking a mile a minute to my friends, not really taking into account everything around us, including the people. Steph at some point had started warily looking over my shoulder and responding with one-word answers while Jessie was quietly staring the bags in her lap. I wasn't so naive that I wasn't aware there was something up. The moment I looked around, my eyes caught on the two men standing a few feet away, quietly talking to one another and pointedly looking at the direction of my friends and I. Here's where I will always be grateful that Brad was with us. He had positioned himself right in front of us, standing facing us while still keeping those men in his line of sight. He later told me he was purposefully squaring his shoulders and making the effort to engage with us so he gave off the impression we were with him. I really should give him more credit because at the time I wasn't entirely aware of how tense the situation was. But a few minutes after I had noticed the men, the loud sound of the doors connecting the train cars together banged open and a large man started making his way up the train. The two men who had been focused on us immediately began berating the man and loudly making crude comments. Steph informed me later it was because the guy had a gang tattoo visible across his neck and the two men had been calling him out and crap talking to him. Thankfully our stop came up and we quickly got off. Brad was towering behind us, so I didn't see the two men also get off, but could still hear them berating the other guy very loudly. I don't think I've ever power walked as hard as I did the two blocks back to the motel. Now, I do have to acknowledge that my experience is most likely a norm in a city like Chicago. But I had never encountered an interaction like that, so yes I was shaken. It wasn't until I was back at home two days later that a random news article popped up on my phone and I immediately recognized the mugshots of the two men who had been targeting my friends and I that day on the train. The article stated these two men were wanted for assault and robbery with a deadly weapon for an incident that had happened just a few days before our encounter with them. The incident had also taken place on the red line, the same train that my friends and I had taken that day. My friend's reaction to this article was one of wary concern, but they were more aware of the goings of the big city near them than I had been. Since then, I have become more aware of my surroundings. And I have also visited Chicago three more times in the last few years for events like concerts and Lollapalooza. And each time I come away with a new nightmare scenario. From the time we were harassed by a group of young men on the train, and I truly believe the woman next to us who claimed we were all her daughters is the reason we escaped the situation. To see a dead body slumped over in a wheelchair on the stair landing of the train station or being stalked by a man with a gun for three blocks from the station in Evanston. Let me know if you'd like to hear any of these stories for your enjoyment, because I will live with these memories every time I go back to Chicago. So, I guess let me start off with a little background information. My name is Carolyn, and I live in Ohio. I'm 22 years old. During the summer of 2019, one of my good friends, let's call him Kevin, moved to Chicago for an internship. My other friends and I wanted to visit him, and we thought the best time to do that would be during Pride, as four out of the five people that all went, myself included, are LGBT members. Our plan was to go to the pre-parade festival, which takes place a week before the parade. I had never been to Chicago before, but I have always wanted to go to a big city like that before. I grew up in a very rural part of Ohio with a very small population. To kind of put this in perspective, we had 48 people in our graduating class, and we could see cows from our school windows. Anyway, my friends and I made plans to take a bus all the way from Ohio to Chicago, which on its own was awful, but I'm not about to write why a dirty bus ruined my trip to the big city. So on the bus with me was another one of my good friends, who we will call Darren, and Kevin's little sister, Lisa. We arrived in Chicago late on Friday night and crammed into Kevin's small big city apartment, which didn't have extra beds, mind you, so all four of us crammed on top of two twin-sized mattresses mushed together to create what kind of resembled a king. I'm getting off topic. We woke up on Saturday ready to face the first day of the festival. 
All of us got dressed, loaded a bunch of vodka into water bottles, and set off to Pride. If the day had continued as it had started, I would have had an amazing time, and probably would not be writing this right now. But, here I am. The festivities went as follows, danced, spent way too much money, drank a lot of alcohol, bowed down to some drag queens all before my phone was stolen right out of my purse. Annoying. Thankfully, I was ready for an upgrade, so it could have been a lot worse. We decided that the phone thief had pretty much ruined the night at the festival, so we decided to retire early and hop on the subway. And let me tell you, the subway was the second scariest thing to me on this whole trip. I literally almost threw myself into a panic attack every time it made a sharp turn or it squealed. Like I said, I'm from Butt Freak Nowhere, Ohio. We don't have subways. We don't even have taxis. I ended up finding out the only way I could help my anxiety stay at bay was if I sat down on one of the seats. That way I wasn't getting thrown all over the train car like I was in some godforsaken city snow globe. So we board the subway and I see only one seat open and it's next to a man who was clearly very intoxicated. But who could I judge? I was also tipsy at this point. So I had the choice if I wanted to sit next to this drunk, very big dude, or risk a possible heart attack as I got thrown around. My friends found a pretty open space a little ways up the train car, so I walked up to the man and asked him if I could sit down. The man looked me up and down and said, sure, honey. I thanked him and took the seat. Now if this was any normal situation, I would have taken my phone out and sent texts out played games, whatever to basically say to this man, please do not talk to me, but alas, some a-hole decided to steal my phone just an hour ago, so F me I guess. The man immediately starts talking with me. He saw the rainbows on my shirt and the glitter on my face and asked, so what, are you like a lesbian? I didn't want to get into the talk of the difference between being a lesbian and pansexual, so I settled with, yep. This man rolled his eyes and began telling me that his nephew had just come out as gay and how disappointed he was in it, and that if he ever invited him to a family get-together, that he would remind his nephew not to bring his significant other. Which okay, first of all, very rude of you, but I digress. He then starts asking me why I don't like men and that lesbians still use a strap-on, so what's the difference? It made me very uncomfortable, to say the least, so I just weaseled my way out of the question saying, I, different folks, different strokes. Then, out of nowhere, he tells me, you know, I just got out of prison a couple days ago. Prison, not jail, but prison. My heart dropped to the floor of the bus. He continues, was in there for 11 years. I was about to ask him why he was in prison, but I stopped myself. I didn't want to know. I'm not sure what one has to do to be incarcerated for 11 years, so I thought best to just let it go and leave it unknown. We still had a couple stops left, unfortunately. The man asked me where I was getting off, if I lived around here, if I'd been in Chicago long, if I was married, if I had kids, how old I was, etc. Everything and anything he could ask, basically. Then he put his arm around my shoulder and brought me closer towards him. I froze. I didn't know what to do. When it comes to fight or flight, I will freaking soar if that's what it takes to get out of a situation, but I was literally locked down. I looked over and caught the eyes of Kevin, and he could tell something was wrong. Thankfully, he walked over, and the man loosened his grip on me. The man asked who he was, and I told him it was the friend I was staying with while I visited. The man looked Kevin up and down and said, looks like a sissy to me. Kevin, who is obviously more bold and fearless than I just said, yeah, what of it? Inside, I wanted to scream at Kevin. Like, bruh, don't make him aggravated, homie just got out an 11-year prison sentence. The man asks Kevin again, how long have you been in Chicago? Kevin told him he's been here for a couple months. The guy then gets quiet and says, and I quote, you're going to die here. Have you ever been on one of those amusement park rides where you are brought up really high on a tower and then it lets go and sends you straight to the bottom? That's how I felt. Like, was this a threat? It sounded like one. At this point, Kevin is actually starting to get a little uncomfortable, but just shrugs it off. 
The man's arm is still wrapped around my shoulders and gripping my arm. I asked him, uh, and why is that? He leaned in really close to me and said, watch this. I didn't know what he was going to do. I was terrified. I never want to hear someone say you're going to die and then followed by watch this, like no thank you. The man asks Kevin for some money, and Kevin says, sorry, I only carry a card, no cash. I can smell the alcohol and the stench that is this man's breath as he leans even closer and said, see? He's going to say that to someone, and they're going to stab him. Get him. The rest of the ride contained a whole more talk like this, drunk ramblings, and weird threats. At this point my mind was starting to check out because I was just so uncomfortable and scared, but I remember his hand remained on me. Another weird thing he said was, if I have another kid, I'm going to jail. I asked why, and he said, it's what God wants for me. It's in the stars. Needless to say, when our stop came up, we all booked it off the subway. I slipped out of his grasp and muttered for him to have a nice night. Thankfully, we remained on the bus, but I was scared for a moment he was going to follow us. We decided to head out for drinks that night at a local gay bar, where Kevin's phone was also stolen, so that was a little funny in its weird coincidental way. We went to the festival after our Verizon shopping haul the next morning, where I went full on gay getup. A holographic bodysuit, black tassel shorts, and a gay pride flag cape tied around my neck. This is where another disturbing thing happened, though in my mind, not quite as scary as the one of the night before. We had just passed through the subway gate after scanning our pass, and a homeless man on the other side of the gate started yelling slurs at me. He yelled, take that cape off. Take the cape off you dumb girl. He basically repeated those things one after another again, with other profanity and gay slurs laced in between. I was almost a little worried he was going to hop the fence and come after me, but there was thankfully a guard there watching him. As I am awkward, and deal with judgment and hate very badly, I stuttered out, thank you, have a nice day. So to the city of Chicago. Maybe I only got to see the worst of you, and I might be a little quick to trigger, but I can't say I'll ever be going back. This was probably nine years ago, I think. I was a junior in college and had quite the whirlwind weekend planned for myself. I was headed to two different film festivals, one in Boston and one in New York City. From South Bend, Indiana, I took the train to Chicago and caught a flight to Boston and stayed there for most of Saturday until I had to catch a bus to New York City for the next festival. As soon as I was done in New York on Sunday, I headed back to Boston for a few hours until I caught my flight back to Chicago. Once I got to Chicago, it was too late for me to catch a train back to South Bend, so my roommate had hooked me up with a friend who said I could stay at his place while he was gone. I didn't know Chicago too terribly well, but I knew that his place was about a 45-minute ride on the subway from where I was going to get on. It was about 2 a.m. on Sunday when this story took place. There wasn't anybody in my subway car. It was cold, late, and I hadn't slept in a couple of days because of the travel. I had my headphones on with music playing, mostly to keep myself awake. A couple of stops after I got on, the doors opened up behind me, and somebody else came in. Since it was late and I had my headphones on, I was trying not to pay much attention, but this guy decided to sit right across from me on the empty train. I looked up. He was big and fat. He was wearing a crappy costume pirate hat. His lips were moving like he was saying something or singing, I couldn't tell. But he was looking right at me, and I know he saw me make eye contact. Meanwhile, I was glancing at the subway map trying to figure out just how much longer I had before I could get off the train. That's when I noticed out of the corner of my eye he was moving his sleeve. I turned the volume down on my music, but that just made it seem worse. He was mumbling something incoherent in between fits of singing some sort of Spanish song. From his sleeve he pulled out what appeared to be an obviously fake small cap gun and held it on his lap. He continued singing while he pointed it at me. Pretty certain that this was some sort of drunken lunatic I just kept on pretending to listen to music while constantly looking at him through the corner of my eye. Dear God, why couldn't anybody else get on this train? I still have seven more stops. He laughed to himself and put the cap gun away. 
Just as soon as he did that he reached for his other sleeve. This time he pulled out a silver handgun. Thank God there was the little orange cap on the end of it, but my heart stopped for a second. He continued to mumble and pointed at me, and I continued to listen to my silent headphones without saying anything. He stared at me for the next six stops until I got off the train. I still had a mile to walk before I got to my friend's empty apartment. I didn't sleep much that night. No one really understands how dangerous social media can be. It's such a different world where anyone can be whoever they want. I was 16 at the time this story happened. I was always on MySpace, typical teenager stuff. I get a few messages here and there. But there was this one kid who would constantly send me messages. I would reply sometimes with a typical hello or what's up kind of thing. I thought nothing of it. One day me and my friend named Hannah were walking around the city as usual. We stopped in this complex building that is near my house just to take a break. We were sitting on the stairs when some guy came up behind us and said to my friend Hannah, Do you have a lighter? She said no. He then walks away. Then after about 15 minutes, he came back and stood behind me. I see in my peripheral a hand movement happening, so I turned a little more and saw his hand in his pants moving up and down while facing me. My heart instantly went into my stomach. I wrote on my phone, in a text, to Hannah and said, I think he's touching himself. We both felt stuck. He sat down next to Hannah, so close that he was touching her arm. I pretended to be on the phone so maybe he would leave. He looks at Hannah and goes, is her name Nadia, as he was referring to me. Hannah was instantly scared and blurted out ask yourself, but I was still pretending to be on the phone. About five minutes later the security guard walked around and said hello to us then talked to the kid named Antonio. I said, what's up Antonio, hanging with the ladies tonight? I knew help had to be written all over my face. Why can't he see it? Then he says, well if I hear of two white girls who go missing, I know who to call at this point I feel more sick than I already did. The security guard left and yet Hannah and I were still sitting there feeling more stuck than ever. Few minutes later his friend comes along and goes, want to come inside. I finally have enough energy to say no, I have to go meet up with my cousin. We start to get up and Antonio's friend stands in front of me and says, come on just for a little bit. I say, no, me and Hannah don't want to, and we start walking towards the exit because my house is up the hill. They start following us. We get inside the tunnel, and Hannah says take off your shoes so we can run. We don't want them hearing where we go. So there we are, barefoot running like our lives depended on it. We got onto my street, ran up to my house, went into the back hallway, and it was so quiet that all I heard was myself trying to catch my breath, and I heard my heart beating in my ears. I looked at Hannah scared. Just hiding behind a wall staring at the glass door waiting to see someone pop up. We eventually calmed each other down. Thought everything was over until the next morning when I logged into MySpace and had a message from him saying, I know what house you live in with my street name. I blocked him. I never walked past that complex again. Few weeks later, I found out he was in jail, and from what I know now, at 25 years old, that he's still in jail. I can only imagine what he did. But I hope I never run into him again. On the morning of April 12th, th, 2018, 27-year-old Ranita Williams of Shreveport, Louisiana was at home, minding her own business. She lived at home with her mother, Anita, and had just broken up with her long-term boyfriend, Jonathan Robinson. Like many relationships, the breakup had been a messy one, and a great deal of drama had unfolded on social media websites, mainly the most popular of them, Facebook. Apparently, Jonathan had moved on rather quickly from Renita, and had recently started dating a woman from Houston, Texas, named Sharika Taylor. And although it's not entirely clear what the ins and outs of the social media drama were, there had definitely been some of exchange between the two women that had seriously enraged Jonathan Robinson. 
As foolish as it often is, men sometimes attempt to defend the honor of the women in their lives, but no one could have expected Jonathan to take such extreme measures in what amounted to little more than an exchange of harsh words. Because before Jonathan pulled up to Renita's place on the morning of April 12th th, he had just driven by his aunt's house to retrieve something he'd previously hidden in the basement of her home, a high-caliber, semi-automatic rifle. He was so delirious with anger that he didn't even bother to turn off the engine of the vehicle he'd driven up in. He simply grabbed the rifle from the passenger seat, kicked in the dead-bolted front door to the house, and then started shooting. It seems those first few shots were merely to terrify those in the home, because no one was actually hurt during the first few minutes of the attack. Whilst her mother and younger brother escaped from the rear of the home, Jonathan quickly located a terrified Ranita, who believed she was about to be immediately executed, but apparently her ex-boyfriend had other plans for her first. Keeping her at gunpoint, he told her to grab her cell phone and begin a Facebook Live broadcast. At first, Ranita had no idea why she would need to do something like that, but all slowly became clear when Jonathan began to demand she apologize to Taylor, his new girlfriend. In a terrifying public display of humiliation, Jonathan could be seen pointing the barrel of his rifle the mother of three's head while he made her apologize over and over again for the perceived offense. She was terrified, voice quivering as she complied. Meanwhile, Renita's mother was hiding in the backyard, having had the foresight to grab her cell phone before fleeing from the gunshots. With shaking hands, she hammered 911 onto her phone's touchscreen, then begged the dispatcher to send help in a hushed but terrified tone. Yet the police were far closer than she could have imagined, because Officer Brittany Mackey was actually within earshot of the gunfire. As soon as she heard shots, she rolled up to St. Vincent Avenue at Natalie Street and got out of her vehicle with her pistol drawn. Jonathan Robinson looked up to see the cops arrive mere minutes after he'd burst into the home, and he was seething with rage. He immediately executed Ranita as she kneeled on the floor below him, then walked out of the busted front door and began shooting at Officer Mackey. Using of trees and parked vehicles as cover, Jonathan sent round after round of high-caliber rifle fire into the officer's patrol vehicle, forcing her into cover. Mackey immediately got on her radio and began calling in backup, with her colleagues actually hearing the sound of gunfire over the airwaves. She then got as low behind the back wheel of her patrol car as she possibly could and prayed for swift reinforcements. Just two minutes later, that backup arrived in the form of Corporals Joshua Pettigrew and Greg Walker. They screeched up the street, coming to a stop just short of Officer Mackey's patrol car. The officers then jumped out of their vehicle, took cover behind the open doors, and sent a torrent of .45 caliber pistol bullets at Jonathan's firing position. The overwhelming firepower pushed him back into the house, and the two corporals lost track of their target. The next two cops on the scene were two special response team members, Corporals Landry Dipto and Michael Gerbine. The pair took off running for the other side of the street, but Jonathan opened fire once again, this time from a vantage point on the second floor of the house he was occupying. The air around them cracked and whizzed with 7.62 bullets, ricocheting off the concrete as they narrowly missed their targets, but luckily, neither officer was wounded. He's in a sniper position, he's in a sniper position, another officer can be heard screaming on a police cruiser's dash cam, get down, god damn it. Robinson had the supreme advantage of a concealed, elevated position coupled with high-caliber weaponry, and for almost an hour, he kept every officer pinned down and unable to approach his position. They were so heavily outgunned that the only two shots they managed to fire were to disable the car Robinson left running in the driveway when he barged into the Williams' home. Plus, the police had no idea where he was even shooting from and couldn't risk civilian casualties by peppering the entire home with bullets. To the officers pinned down at the scene, waiting for a full special response team to arrive seemed like an eternity. Eventually, a full police SWAT team was pushing up towards the house, preparing to breach and clear the entire structure to locate and eliminate the active shooter. Yet just as the team was cleared to breach, Jonathan indicates to those on scene that he wished to surrender. They hesitated and fell right into his trap. He opened fire on them first and sent a bullet smashing through SRT operative Robert Entrican's right wrist. I've been hit. 
and Treakin cried over his radio. Officer hit. Another torrent of bullets are exchanged for a few moments before a sudden lull in the volume of fire. Then, to the surprise of the attending officers, Jonathan appeared to walk out of the busted front door. Again. Only this time, he was unarmed, and he proceeded to lie down on the front lawn of the house in a show of surrender. The SRT rushed in, putting cuffs on the executioner before dragging him away. Renita's mother and brother are led away from the scene safely, but heartbreakingly, Renita had succumbed to her wounds before the EMTs could get to her. At his murder trial, Jonathan Robinson pled guilty to first-degree murder and admitted to investigators that he fired on police officers because he wanted to die. He narrowly escaped the death penalty by agreeing to a plea deal presenting to him by prosecutors and was later sentenced to life in prison. A hundred years ago, a person would have to drag another into a busy street to perform a public execution. But nowadays, all it takes is a few button clicks on a cell phone to have all your family and friends watching as you're executed in cold blood by some deranged killer. And such incidents can happen so fast that there's simply no way of preempting or actively censoring them, no matter how hard Facebook might try. As long as there's the technology available that allows us to share all the intimate details of our lives, humanity seems to relish in sharing not just the good and positive, but also the darker, more terrifying things too. I live here in a place called Mountain City, down here in Tennessee. So this is going back to about 10 years after I graduated high school, when this really messed up story started going around about one of the other kids I graduated with. It starts in the worst possible way too, because first I heard of it was a buddy of mine texting me saying, did you hear about Billy Payne? I text back saying no, and he then calls me all serious sounding to say that Billy and his baby mom got shot just a few days before. Like someone rolled up to their house, bust open the door and just shot them both right there in front of the TV. They were legit executed. Some of the papers said it was a single shot to the head that killed both victims and how Billy's throat had been slashed. We got to wondering why someone might do something like that. If it was a random psycho killer or if he was moving weight and managed to step on someone's toes. I did remember hearing about Billy messing around with drugs a few times, so it wasn't totally out of the question, but he must have done something serious to have whoever it was shoot his baby mom right there too, like that's real cold-blooded, you know? But even saying that, he just didn't seem like the kind of guy to get involved with serious gangsters. Anyway, the cops catch the two guys who committed the murder, one of them is this Vietnam vet who said in court that he was ex-CIA too. Anyway, they get charged, go up in front of a judge, and you know why they said they did it? Because the CIA had told them that the two murder victims were part of some evil group that was planning on killing their daughter. But in reality, Billy Payne and his baby mom were shot dead because they unfriended one of the killer's daughters on Facebook. Can you actually believe that? That someone would take social media that seriously and actually kill somebody because of a friend request? I mean, I didn't, I was convinced there was more to it than that. And as much as it made me feel like a gorehound, I stayed interested in the trial to find out why they'd done something so horrendous. Like the cops found Billy's kid alive in his mom's arms, the poor kid is gonna grow up with a mother and father. But then yeah, that's the only reason or motive established, and the prosecutor brings up Facebook messages detailing intense arguments between Billy, his girlfriend, and the girl who got unfriended. They'd argue about it back and forth for hours, with some pretty harsh language exchanged too, and then the girl says she's going to go tell her dad. I don't know if the girl just didn't expect her dad to actually go kill them, or that she knew he'd overreact, but if it's the latter then she has blood on her hands too, as far I'm concerned. Like it's the way she told her dad too, she didn't just tell him directly, she invented some fake CIA agent that got in touch with her dad over Facebook to tell them all this messed up stuff about how their daughter was in grave danger. I suppose it just scares me that people could take something like Facebook that seriously. But it's obvious that some people out there put so much belief in social media that they're willing to kill over perceived insults or whatever. That's why I keep my social media presence pretty small these days. 
Aside from all the ratchety drama that goes on in our timelines every so often, it's just not a healthy place for some people, and it kind of blows my mind that Facebook could be the reason that anyone got shot.